Good evening and welcome to uh, Lecture 2, Week 2 in uh, Christian Doctrines 2. I trust uh, this lecture finds you uh, well, happy, and ready to study and learn. And We offer up our studies as worship to the Lord. And I thank you for being a part of this. Father, would you receive our studies today, both our, our reading, our listening, our viewing, our thinking. Receive it as worship. We welcome your presence upon uh, all of our contemplation of the greatness of who you are and what you continue to do in our lives. I pray, Lord, that where there's distractions or sickness or just fatigue, that you'd come in by your Spirit and touch, uh, touch every student in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome. We've just uh, finished uh, two great days at uh, Gateway Church and, of course, all of the uh, on-ground uh, King students here in the uh, Dallas South Lake area have been busy these two days as part of their practicums in the in the um, Gateway Conference. You can uh, go online to uh, Gateway Church, GatewayPeople.com, www.GatewayPeople.com, and you can uh, look at those messages and and enjoy part of that. I would like for you to take your textbook in hand. We're going to look at a a couple of themes. I'm going to do this a little different this session. Rather than try to teach you the material, I'm going to lean on you to do your reading. Certainly the reading that uh, has been uploaded in your site on uh, the relational view of sin. Uh, I don't know if that's the exact name I've given it, but uh, you'll find it there. It's uh, an extra reading, I think 14 pages. And I hope you've got that uh, already uh, digested and make some notes on that. We'll be talking about that in our, in our discussion board. And you'll also see some key points there on your final exam from that relational view of sin in um, uh, the reading that's going to come through uh, in your final, final exam. So uh, with your textbook in hand, I want to just remind you very quickly why we're doing uh, the process of uh, Millard Erickson's uh, Christian doctrines uh, different than the way he's laid that out. Uh, I hope that uh, if you weren't in Christian Doctrines 1, you saw from uh, our first week's lecture and video that we don't look at man through the broken mirror or the broken lens of sin. You can never see man for what God designed and created him to be by looking at the man in sin. So we have to get behind that. We have to look at man as he was meant to be, and you can only see that by looking at Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one true man, the true human, the rehumanization of humanity. And so we ask the questions uh, on the nature of God. Now, if you look at your table of contents in your textbook, you'll notice something that's true of nearly every systematic theology textbook that you'll read, and that is that those textbooks will start with what theology is, how to think theologically, and then uh, the Bible, God's revelation, etc. And then it may be the fourth, fifth, sixth chapter before they get to the nature of God. Uh, what I'm proposing to you is that we really can't even interpret uh, the Scripture properly in the progressive revelation that's given to us unless we look at the Scriptures through the lens of Jesus Christ, which gives us the nature of God, because Jesus is the fullness or the overflow of the Godhead bodily. And that's why we've made such a case for you that the Scriptures are a progressive revelation. You can't jump in the middle of a narrative and uh, know the story. You have to look at the end. And so in times past, the Hebrew writer says, God spoke to us by the prophets. That's the Old Testament Scriptures. But now He's spoken to us by His Son. That is the highest revelation, the express image of God. And so we can't possibly understand the Old Testament for sure or all of Scripture as God's revealed it to us as we were able to handle that unless we see Jesus as the revealer of the nature of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what I want to point out to you, once again, if you look at the, uh, the table of contents in Millard Erickson's Christian Doctrine, you'll notice that there's um, uh, a lot about Scripture, and then we get to the nature of God and then the work of God. A uh, very short uh, chapter here on evil, God's world, that's where we're going to start, and then humanity. The problem that I have with this, and who am I to contest it, but 
This is what we do as scholars. You know that you become a scholar when you challenge the way scholars think. And uh, part five in your book is on humanity. Well, humanity, um, anthropology, is stuck right in between evil and God's world, uh, chapter 16. Then you've got humanity as 16, uh, or excuse me, 18, 19, 20. And then you've got sin as chapters 21, 22, 23. Well, we, we covered humanity uh, in Christian Doctrines 1 following the nature of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then humanity. Why? Because man was not made broken. Man was not made in sin. Man was made in the image of God. And so if you want to study man through a broken lens, a broken mirror, you're never going to see man as God made him to be. So again, I'm trying to make a point to you to get you to think about how we can rightly perceive uh, the nature of man as seen in Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's what? He's a new creature. So you can't study that new creature by studying the broken lens. So we've pulled humanity out. We put that in Christian Doctrines 1, studying that in the light of the nature of God. If you want to see how man was meant to be, you have to study the nature of God, not sin, not evil in the world. Okay. And so we, we will need to study uh, homartiology uh, and then soteriology together because what you believe about sin is going to determine uh, what you think the remedy ought to be, that is salvation. So I just want to point that out to you. You notice that in the table of contents. So we've already dealt with humanity. We're going to now deal with evil uh, in God's world and then uh, sin soteriology. And I want you to hear this carefully, please. It's going to be very important that you read the textbook and all the texts that uh, we've given to you. But in particular, these two, uh, for week two, you should have the relational nature of sin in contrast to what you're going to read in Millard Erickson as an evangelical view of um, sin from what we would call probably a Roman lens, a uh, judicial satisfaction view, or Jesus restraining, uh, keeping an angry God from wiping us out. So I'm going to take you very quickly through a number of slides. These are not for you to use in place of uh, the text, but to show you what you need to be looking for in the text as you read and as you're making notes. So evil and uh, God's world. And uh, we'll just begin very quickly with what I believe to be a critical statement. God's ultimate answer to evil and suffering is not an explanation. It's the incarnation. God's ultimate answer is not an explanation, but the incarnation. God chose to take evil upon himself in the form of a man. Jesus Christ. We'd have to study, and you'll need to take a look in your own studies as you're reading the text, Isaiah chapter 54, verses 10 through 55, verse 7, and we'll notice that God says it's here, evil is here, but it didn't come from me. That's a very important statement, because if you just read the first part of this chapter, he talks about forming um, the... Um, the one that creates or the one that destroys. But he says, it's here, the destruction's here, the evil's here, but it didn't come from me. In fact, just come to me, get full of me, and nothing by any means uh, will hurt you. Important statement. So, I want to say to you that evil is a uniquely Christian problem, and it's our glory not to run from it. Uh, this may surprise you, but there's no other religion on the planet that has to deal with evil the way Christianity does. And I want to just take you quickly through uh, to show you what I mean. Buddhism, for example, says this present world is an illusion and the aim of human life is to escape it. So it's not real, it's an illusion. Hinduism would say that suffering in this life is the consequence of one's actions in a previous life. So this is how we're going to explain evil. Uh, it's something that someone else did. Marxism says the world is moving in a determined way. That is social evolution. We're rising up higher and higher. Well, it doesn't look like that 
uh, if you watch the evening news, does it? The absolute need for violence are the necessary evil, the growing pains, which will be justified by the end result. You'll see this embedded in liberation theology in James Cone, um, which has been popularized from Latin America now, uh, very popular in North America. If you have uh, heard any of the Reverend Wright uh, preaching, then you understand what this is about. That violence is condoned because it is a necessary evil to get us to the real goal, um, which is, of course, Marxism and communism. Then Islam would say the world is in a state of wickedness because the message of Allah through Muhammad has not yet spread to all people. So this will be the panacea, and this is what ISIS is about, this is what jihad is about, this is what radical Islam is about. Um, Muhammad has said that peace is going to come when Allah is worshipped globally, and there's nothing short um, in Islam than a declaration that all the world will be submitted to or subjugated to uh, Islam. So evil is not a problem. We just have to get the whole world under um, Allah, and uh, then it's taken care of. It's a necessary evil. What about atheism? Atheism, of course, would say evil is not a problem because evil doesn't actually exist. Uh, there's nothing absolute. Everything is relative. Therefore, what may be your evil may not be my evil. If it's all relative, does evil even exist? Atheism says if God exists, He's all-powerful. If He's all-powerful, then He's in a position to stop evil and suffering. But evil and suffering continue. Therefore, God uh, does not exist. Do you see the circularity in that thinking? So when it comes down to it, who's having to deal with evil? Well, there's an escapism mentality or uh, a total uh, disregard of the, the necessity of evil, except in Christianity. In Christianity, uh, we say evil is a real problem and it must be dealt with in uh, a real way and it must be dealt with in a way of justice. So some points to consider. God's not the author of evil and suffering. Uh, we believe that. I trust that you see that through Scripture. How do we see that? Again, uh, you look at Jesus, who is the express image of the Father. Whatever Jesus did in His earthly life and ministry shows us what the Father did in a given situation. Jesus never put sickness and disease on anyone. Jesus never killed anyone. In fact, Jesus said, I've got all authority, but I did not come to condemn the world. I came that the world might be taken back to the Father or that we bring many sons to glory. So we see the Father's loving heart through Jesus. God is not the author of evil. Though evil and suffering isn't from God, God can use it to accomplish good. We see that in Joseph's statement. You meant it for harm, but God turned it for good. We would be very wise to be careful how we make statements about God doing something or bringing something of evil or destruction in our life. Be very careful that we understand through the New Testament lens, which you won't see very clearly in the Old Testament, through the New Testament lens, Jesus pulls the curtain back on the spirit dimension and shows us the realm of demons uh, and what they're setting out to do. And He casts them out, gives them no permission to speak, etc. So suffering and evil is not from God but God will use whatever we give Him to fulfill His purpose. And so we'd say the jury's still out. The day is coming when the suffering will cease and God will judge all evil. So no matter how bad the situation looks today, understand this, we're not done. God is going to ultimately show us how all of this is going to turn out. And this is the purpose for the book of Revelation. Revelation is not a book with a bunch of tormenting kinds of visions and scenes and how bad it's going to be. Revelation is quite the opposite. It says, blessed is the man that reads this book. And ultimately, to the first century church, those readers would have heard what we should be hearing in the book today. No matter how bad it might be, no matter what the circumstance might be, uh, jury's still out. God's not done. He's going to turn this all for His glory. And in the end, uh, He will receive glory and and be praised. So, some more points to consider. Evil's worst will pale in comparison with the glory of God yet to be revealed. And then both evil and good 
reveal what is in us. And of course, this again, God drawing us to Himself. He wants our hearts more than anything else. So these things will refine us and uh, reveal what's in our hearts. So the key to sorting through our responses to evil and good is to ask God, what do you want to say to me to teach me about who I am is revealed in my response to what has happened. I want to just say to you again, this is a key to growing in spiritual maturity and your life in God. Turn every word, every circumstance, every situation in your life into a conversation with Abba. Turn it into a conversation by asking Him questions. Even if He gives you a revelation, if He gives you a word, uh, a verse of Scripture jumps off the page at you in your devotions. Don't just say, oh, praise God, I got a word from God. No, turn it into a conversation. Father, what else do you want to say to me about this? How do you want to work this into my life? What do you want to do in me that makes this verse so powerful and so necessary for me today? And then listen some more. God is after conversation with His children. So what, it, what is it about God that we see in the Old Testament? We covered this last week. And so I just touch on this as a reminder, three thoughts to ponder. The first has to do with God, the second with culture and context, and the third with how we understand uh, Scripture itself. Okay, three thoughts. Number one, God meets us where we are. Does this sound familiar to you? Humans hide, but God comes calling. The stunning part of the Abraham-Isaac story isn't that God asked him to kill Isaac, but that Yahweh shows himself to be the God who will provide his own Sacrifice. I'm not the God of Molech like the one you've been serving. I am the provider. I'll give you what you need. So he's revealing himself as something different than uh, the pagan God that Abraham's been serving. Secondly, the world of the Old Testament is far different from our own world. And then the third, the Old Testament is not the last word on God. This should be still fairly fresh in your thinking. When we read the Old Testament, we, we must ask, where's the story going? And the answer is always Jesus. In the Old Testament, God is always the hero. Where is it leading us? It's leading us to Jesus, the Son, who is the perfect express image of the Father. Jesus, the Word who became flesh, is the last word uh, on God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The true nature of God comes to a clear focus, finally and fully, in Jesus Christ. This is what all of Paul's epistles were about, showing us not only who God is as seen in Christ, but who you and I are in Christ. So that in Christ message is a powerful one. So here are some questions on evil from Erickson. I know I'm going very rapid here. You can, you can watch it again, slow it down, but basically I'm trying to highlight some things I want you to be looking for and certainly contrast that you'll be asking as you read this brief uh, chapter uh, in the book. Why is it difficult to explain the problem of evil? Why is it difficult, more difficult for Christians to do that than for those of other religions? What's the solution to these problems and what's the response to these solutions? How does human freedom affect the problem of evil? That is free will. Uh, is, is it all just evil? Do we look at it different ways? Is there a part that man in his choices plays in the exacerbation of evil? And then how do we rightly define the terms good and evil? Theodicy is an important word, and you should jot this one down. You'll see this again uh, at the end of our seven weeks together. Theodicy is an explanation of the justice of God in the face of counter evidence. When it looks like God is um, justifying evil, validating evil, or even calling for evil. How do we look at that and say God is just? All instances of evil may not be the same fundamental type or of the same source may thus have different explanations. Some of those, human error. Some of those, human will or hatred. Some of those, satanic in nature. So we can confuse evil with bad things that happen as a result of man's imperfections. Some types of solutions that you'll look for in Erickson's writings, finitism, that's a rejection of omnipotence, uh, modification of the concepts of God's goodness, that is we redefine what goodness is. We want to say, well, these things, they, they're painful to us, and yes, God took your, your mother or your sister or these 300 people died in this 
fiery plane crash, but this is God and this, this is goodness. Well, uh, no human being with common sense would put that kind of definition on goodness, but uh, we uh, theologians will, will try to do that. And then a denial of evil by a denial of reality. So here are some themes to look for as you're reading uh, through this brief chapter, and then we begin to look at sin. Is evil a necessary accompaniment for man to have free will, that is, being in the nature and image of God? Secondly, a reevaluation of what constitutes good and evil. Do we get to redefine uh, the terms? Then, in that sense, good is defined in a relationship to the will and being of God. Good and evil may look different from a long-term view than a short-term view, and then we tend to judge individualistically when perhaps God is not looking just through an individualistic lens. Also, evil in general, as a result of sin. When man sinned, did he or did he not open the floodgates of evil upon the world? And thus, now we deal with a broken world. Uh, a world, we could say, full of germs, full of diseases, full of viruses, uh, full of mechanical failure due to the imperfections of, of man's uh, creativity, etc. And then God as the victim of evil, and that's the one I want you to pay attention to. This is what makes Christianity different from all the other religions. Our God has actually chosen not to ignore, discount, or diminish evil, or to put it off uh, for a later date, such as reincarnation. God has actually chosen to become the victim of evil in our world and to pay the price. So this is what he says to us. What a measure of love this is. How anyone could impugn the goodness of God for allowing sin and consequently evil must measure that charge against Scripture that God Himself became the victim of evil so that He and we might be victorious over evil together. So, final questions. How could good angels, and especially Lucifer, choose sin and especially since they lived in the very presence of God. Was there some little bit of sin already present? Is God, as creator of all things, the author of sin, thus evil, and therefore responsible for all that has and will happen? What other questions does this raise? Are there some things that we simply do not understand with our finite minds? Then I want you to go to Erickson, your textbook, page 151, in the second column, about a third of the way down. It's the last sentence um, before the subheading, uh, Evil in General. And um, he makes the statement, rather, what makes God's plans and actions good is the fact that He has willed them. Okay, What makes God's plans, this is Erickson speaking now, and you'll see the Calvinism, that comes out in the statement. What makes God's plans and actions good, no matter what they are, what they look like, is the fact that He has willed them. So we want to ask the question, how is this different from what James says, God doesn't tempt man with evil, neither is He tempted with evil. And uh, what Satan meant for evil, God turned for good. All right, so these are important questions as you're reading through that part um, of your chapter. Have those in mind and we'll be discussing and dialoguing about those things.